is Ross Tapsell. I am a lecturer at the School of Culture, History and Language, and I'm also the director of the ANU Malaysia Institute. Uh, for those who are unaware, the ANU Malaysia Institute was established in around about 2016, um, where our aim was to um, uh, continue the long work on study of Malaysia and um, Southeast Asia and Malaysia in Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, we continue to do so. We run uh, updates every two years, uh, the ANU Malaysia update. And we've been running a webinar series during the uh, pandemic over the past two years. Um, the current one has been organized by Dr. Ying Jing Shou. Um, and it's been a, a wonderful success in collaboration with USM in Penang. So uh, thank you to uh, Hyung, Ho, uh, Hyung, Hyung Hong and Ying Jing for their hard work uh, as, uh, as I um, get an opportunity just to thank them here. I'm very excited today because Prof Farid is uh, going to give a talk about uh, an issue which of course concerns many of us uh, in the field of uh, Malaysia, Malay world studies and history and culture. Um, and he will speak for about uh, 40 minutes. He also has written a piece in New Mandala, um, which we will uh, attach. Uh, we will put the link into the chat um, for you to, there it is there. Thank you, Yingjing. And um, for those of you who would like to read later, uh, you can read uh, his short piece. Um, so Prof. Farid will speak for about um, 40 minutes. And then I'd like to open it up to plenty of debate and discussion. So we might just try a, a new format on sort of amended format where um, if you'd like to comment, we might just stick to verbal uh, comments rather than questions in the chat per se. So if you look at reactions, for those of you new to Zoom, if you go down the bottom of your screen, you can see that there's security and participants and chat. And if you see reactions, if you, if you click on reactions, uh, there's a there's a button there you can click which is raise hand and I'll, I'll be able to see that and we can just go through each question as we would i'll try and keep a list and we'll go through each question verbally um, to respond because i imagine a lot of people would like to uh, to verbally respond rather than write something short and succinct so um i'll i'll reiterate that as we come to the end but uh over to you now prof farid thank you very much um for your um uh, efforts in writing the new Mandela piece and for giving up your time today. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ross, um, and also um, Ying Xin for the ni nice invitation. Um, so I will just uh, um, begin right away. Uh, um, so the, the, the title, as you know, is Malay Studies, Autonomous Knowledge and Decolonial Thought. Um, I'd like to, um, um, well, first of all, let me say that I will, I will deal with three issues. Um, I think I'll make three uh, uh, points. Um, I want to say something about the, the problem of, decolonial, of decolonization of knowledge. Um, then I, um, I move to um, the field of Malay studies. Um, and discuss the uh, tradition of uh, decolonization of knowledge in Malay studies. Um, and um, after that, I, um, well, I end with a, a discussion on the idea of uh, a school of thought um, having emerged from, uh, from Malay studies <clears throat> and how that's related to decolonization of, uh, of knowledge. <clears throat> So let me begin with um, the idea of decolonization of knowledge. Um, one might think that um, you know the last ten years or so um, uh, have been a decade of decolonization, in the sense that there has there has been so much attention uh, to the issue um, in terms of uh, articles, um, uh, books, you know, publications, um, and seminars. And more recently, in the last uh, two years, um, when we are, you know, we've, we've been bombarded with um, uh, with seminars, with webinars, uh, there have been so many around the world on decolonization, um, <clears throat> not only with regard to 
um, the Malay world, actually more with, re with regard to other parts of the world, Africa, Latin America, and even Europe itself. Uh, the idea that knowledge, that um, European or Western knowledge itself needs to uh, be decolonized, that the colonizer needs to decolonize um, um, the mindset. Um, but, um, you know, from all these activities, we might think that decolonization of knowledge is something relatively recent. Uh, the idea is relatively recent. But indeed, um, it, uh, the, the, the ideas emerged decades ago. Um, and as I will say later, I think um, Malay studies was among the first uh, uh, to uh, raise the, the problem and um, constructively deal with the with the issue. But um, what do we mean by decolonization? Just to have an idea of what the problem um, is. Um, decolonization, of course, refers to the attempt to critique and um, overcome the problems of Eurocentric um, knowledge production. Um, one of the, uh, the uh, manifestations of Eurocentrism is the marginalization of thinkers and and ideas that emerge from the local setting, uh, that emerge from the indigenous uh, setting, or that come from the you know the local or indigenous uh, traditions. However, you want to define local or indigenous, whether it refers to indigenous peoples, or whether it refers to um, uh, you know the um, the people who have settled in a particular area for for centuries, whether, uh, whether you're referring to uh, civilizational traditions or religious traditions. Um, uh, whatever we mean by tradition, um, there is generally uh, a mar marginalization or even a total neglect of, uh, of uh, these traditions and uh, uh, the thinkers of that tradition and the ideas that emerge from those traditions. Um, just to give you a very simple example, um, when we teach uh, social theory, when we teach sociology or anthropology in Singapore and Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, it, it's quite remarkable that um, the attention is almost wholly on uh, European thinkers, you know, um, Marx, your, your, you know, the, the usual uh, menu of Marx, Weber and, and, and Durkheim. So the impression is given that there weren't any thinkers in the 19th century who were non-Western and who were female, who were women, who could not or did not think systematically about the nature of society. Um, so when we teach social theory, when we teach uh, the, the uh, formative period, you know, the, the, the formative or the foundational thinkers um, in uh, social theory or the social sciences in general, there is no uh, attention given to Jose Rizal, who was contemporaneous with Marx, uh, Weber and Durkheim. There's no attention to Ibn Khaldun. Um, and, you know, one might say, well, Ibn Khaldun is not really relevant uh, because he was dealing with desert uh, societies, uh, so he's not relevant to the Malay world. Um, but how is Marx uh, relevant? Marx was dealing with European uh, societies. So that clearly there's a notion that there's a universality uh, to be found in the works of uh, European thinkers, which is, which is true. Um, but why isn't, is that not said of, uh, of Ibn Khaldun? Um, and certainly, you know, Rizal was, is from the region, um, but there isn't the idea that there is a social thought to be found in uh, the work of uh, Rizal and that um, one can extract a sociology of colonial society from Rizal and that he should be taught alongside uh, Marx, uh, Weber and, um, and others. Um, and the same thing happens when it comes to, uh, to ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, I... Uh, um, I, I was struck by um, something I read in the work of a prominent Indonesian um, anthropologist um, in, a, in a chapter or a section on society, and this was written in, uh, in Indonesian. Uh, in, in, the, in the part on society, um, well, of course, he's writing Indonesian, so he's using the term masyarakat, but his description of masyarakat was actually a description of the European notion of society. Um, uh, in other words, there was no attempt to, to understand what masyarakat itself uh, meant. Um, when did 
the term masyarakat start to be uh, used to refer to society? Where does it come from? Um, and you know, these are, I think, very fundamental questions um, um, for us as, uh, as social scientists. Um, and when you think about masyarakat, um, you know, when you read um, the works of uh, Indonesians um, uh, in the colonial period, uh, let's say about 100 years ago, I was reading uh, uh, Chokro Minoto's Islam uh, Dan Socialisma. Um, they, they did not even use um, masyarakat. Um, uh, Chokro Minoto used Dutch terms. You know, he used uh, gemeenschap, um, which connotes uh, uh, um, people coming together to, to engage in commerce. Uh, it also... Um, on, on the other hand, it also refers to, uh, you know, uh, has religious connotations, a congregation of, uh, of people. And, and then Chokoro Minoto also uses the word gemeente, also a Dutch word, which uh, um, refers, uh, among other things, to a parish. Um, he uses the term matschap uh, and, and matschape, also a Dutch word. Matschap um, connotes the idea of fellowship um, and uh, matschape, uh, um, company. So you have the notion of, you know, of um, uh, business, of commerce, but also of, uh, you know, uh, coming together of people in the form of a congregation, a parish. Um, but the point is, um, the idea uh, of um, um I guess it's, you know, uh, the Dutch equivalent of uh, Gemeinschaft, the German Gemeinschaft, which was popularized by uh, Ferdinand Tunis, um, uh, has to do with the idea of community rather than society. People's coming together, people's inter people interacting um, at a more personal level rather than the, a larger society where uh, people may inhabit you know, a, a certain space but not necessarily come into contact um, with each other. But why am I saying all of this? Um, it's interesting to ask the question, why do the Malays, why do the people in, in the Malay world use the word masyarakat uh, to, to refer to society? Um, although the word comes from Arabic, uh, it, uh, it is not the word that the Arabs use to, to refer to society. The, the, the Arabs use the word mujtama, not masyarakat, and they never used masyarakat um, um, even in pre-modern times. Um, so, I think the answer has, has, to, has something to do with uh, the meanings of the Dutch uh, uh, terms, which refer to commerce. Um, in Arabic, masharaka refers to partnership, uh, you know, to, a, to a, a, in other words, a company, a business kind of partnership. Um, and indeed, the early Malay dictionaries, um, com you know, compiled by, uh, by the English, um, translates masharakat as a partnership not as society. Um, so I'm just mentioning this you know, to, to suggest that um, one, you know, you can't simply, you know, um, when you're talking about the Malay world and the concept of society, it is necessary to look at the, the roots of, uh, of terms, of words, to understand their connotations, um, and uh, not simply assume that masyarakat means the same thing as the English society or the French Societe or the German uh, Gesellschaft. Um, and uh, this is not simply a matter of terminology, it's a, man it's a matter of, um, of understanding. Um, the, the neglect of concepts from within uh, our society may result in, uh, uh, in a loss of meaning. Um, for example, um, if you take the basic concepts of um, uh, town and country, uh, this dichotomy is basic to European uh, history because the history of, of modern uh, Europe has a lot to do with the conflict between the town and countryside, between the feudal classes and the, and the emerging bourgeoisie in the, in the cities. So this is a basic dichotomy, um, but it's not a basic dichotomy in the Malay world. Um, in, in the Malay world for, uh, for a long time, um, a more basic dichotomy was between land and sea, Orang Laut and Orang Darat. And even on land, uh, you have Hulu and Hilir. Um, so um, 
uh, you know, the, the, the history, uh, the historical development, development is entirely, entirely different. One might, one might argue that um, uh, the, the, um, there are aspects of European um, social science, which is terra centric, which is more land centric, which may be appropriate for Europe or parts of Europe, but not uh, for the study of the, of the Malay world. Now it's this kind of um, imposition of uh, ideas in this case, the imposition of the town-country dichotomy, which led to a, a misunderstanding of Ibn Khaldun. Well, Ibn Khaldun has this distinction between um, 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 Umran Hadari and Umran Badawi, um, which was, which is often translated as rural and urban, um, when in fact, Ibn Khaldun, by that distinction, meant sedentary and nomadic um, and the sedentary included both rural and uh, and urban um, and the nomadic of course was different uh, but because um, some scholars were looking at Ibn Khaldun through the lens of European experience and through European categories they interpreted his dichotomy of Hadari and Badawi in terms of um, uh, town and, and, and country um, and I think that distinction is um, important uh, for the Malay world as well, because it also has something to do with the relevance of Ibn Khaldun to the study of uh, the Malay world. That if we look at the sea as an economy unto itself, not simply as a means of communication, but as an economy unto itself, where you have the, the so-called Orang Laut, um, um, you know, uh, living, um, they were the equivalent of Ibn Khaldun's uh, nomadic uh, de desert nomads. Uh, you know, they were aquatic uh, nomads and like Ibn Khaldun's um, desert nomads, which provided the military support um, for dynasties um, based on land, uh, based in, this, uh, in, the set, in sedentary areas, uh, the sea, uh, the aquatic nomads provided the military support for, um, uh, for dynasties based on land. Um, so the sea was um, a political economy unto itself and a, and a mode of production unto itself. So this just gives you an idea of, you know, why it's necessary to look at uh, the local in terms of concepts, not just for data, but in terms of the, uh, the concepts um, which um, are found in local tradition, in, in the, 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 uh, uh, the, the philosophical or literary tradition, or even in everyday life, um, but have yet um, most of which have yet to be brought into the social sciences as, uh, as concepts. So essentially, this is the problem of, um, of decolonization, uh, the task of decolonization, uh, to, to identify these problems and to, um, uh, to, to, to um, be involved in the reconstruction of knowledge at that level, at the theoretical and uh, conceptual uh, level. Um, now, moving to Malay studies, um, we can say that Malay studies, and here I'm referring to the Department of Malay Studies at the National University of Singapore, was probably, or was among the first and probably um, the very first um, within Singapore, but also I think um, within the larger uh, Malay world to engage in this uh, decolonization, to identify the problem of the coloniality of knowledge, to identify the continuities between um, the colonial period and the post-colonial period in terms of the coloniality of knowledge, to critique that coloniality um, and to, um, um, to engage in the construction of new uh, knowledge based on that critique. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, the, the work uh, to trace the genealogy and the development um, of uh, this decolonial approach um, has yet to be done. Very little has been done uh, on it. Uh, th there will be a talk um, on the 28th of October by Victor King, which does some of this, um, does, which looks at some of this, um, this genealogy. Um, which is, which is organized by the way, uh, by the co-organized by the Department of Malay Studies and Sociology uh, at NUS. 
Um, but um, I was struck by something that was noted by the Philippine, um, by the Filipino journalist John Neri uh, many years ago, about almost 10 years ago. Um, he uh, referred to what he called the Alatas uh, tradition. Now, of course, not referring to me, but to my, uh, to my father. Um, and, uh, you know, he says that there's a lineage of Malaysian scholars uh, begun, begun by uh, Said Hussein Alatas. Um, and he says that we can use the appropriation of Rizal, of Jose Rizal, as object of study or source of inspiration to trace this living uh, tradition of inquiry, beginning with Said Hussein Alatas' um, deconstruction of the, the myth of the lazy native, um, but also, you know, uh, looking at Chandra Muzaffar's founding of, uh, of, the, of the Malaysian uh, movement, social movement, Aliran, um, on Rizal's uh, death anniversary. Um, also looking at Sharuddin Maruf's um, uh, work on the concept of the hero in Malay society, which um, uh, posits Rizal as one of the three ideal uh, heroes, as opposed to, for example, uh, Hang Tua. Um, also, um, Farish knows um, uh, reflections on Rizal and um, my own uh, work on um, alternative discourses in which I use Rizal as both a precursor and a, and a paragon um, for, uh, for a social theory. Um, so um, uh, there is this reference to uh, a tradition of, uh, of scholarship. Um, now, I want to say a few words about that tradition um, because that re relates um, to what I want to, to say about autonomous uh, knowledge. So I need to say something about that tradition which has developed in, uh, in Malay studies. Um, and let me focus um, just for a few minutes on Rizal and, and Alatas. Um, the, um, if we speak about a lineage from Rizal to Alatas, um, it implies that there is a connection and there, is a, uh, there are similarities or parallels between Rizal and, and Alatas. And, I, and um, one way to understand those similarities and parallels is to um, look at their attitude towards, uh, towards discourse, towards colonial discourse. Uh, and I think um, one, if there's one main point we can derive from both Rizal and Alatas is that um, colonial discourse ought not to be taken at face value. And the example given by Rizal was the discourse, the Spanish colonial discourse on laziness, that what the Spaniards saw as uh, inherent laziness um, was actually their own doing due to the nature of, uh, of colonial uh, rule. But rather than um, uh, recognize this, the idea of laziness uh, was uh, used as uh, a dogma to uh, justify colonial rule. So Rizal refers to it as a misused dogma. What Rizal did was to un to turn the argument on its head, to turn you know, the, this idea on its, on its head, uh, the idea that the Filipinos were inherently lazy and that that was a reason for colonization. This was the, 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 the colonial uh, uh, position. Um, so Rizal uh, turned it on its head by saying that colonialism was the reason for the laziness which eventually developed in Filipino uh, society. This was his assumption. In order to prove it, in his mind, he had to examine the pre-colonial past um, to, to see what the Filipinos were up to, um, to see if they were you know, a, a progressive uh, society. Um, Rizal you know, based his ideas on the premise that, and he says this in um, one of his uh, uh, journalistic writings, that the miseries of a people not in control of their destiny should be attributed or blamed on their rulers, not on the people themselves. So in this case, the colonizers. This is, this is his sort of deductive premise from which his thought um, um, emerges. Um, but if he's right on these points, it means that prior to colonial rule, the, the, the Filipinos were not backward. So he goes to the study of uh, pre-colonial history. He looks at the work of uh, Spanish and, and uh, you know, colonial historians, uh, um, and even and other Europeans uh, 
travel writers. Uh, he looks at Pigafetta, for example, who accompanied Magellan on the voyage to, um, to, the, to what um, later became the Philippines. Um, and he says, and he notes that the Filipinos um, controlled trade routes. They were involved in shipbuilding. Uh, and they had many industries. They, they were part of a, a larger network of trade uh, with uh, the rest of the Malay world and so on and so forth. So it comes back to the colonial period and says that, well, the current backwardness of Filipinos has to uh, be accounted for by the nature of colonial rule then. Um, and, and then. And then he looks at um, uh, so many aspects of, of uh, you know, colonial rule, colon colonial administration, exploitation, forced uh, labor, uh, the um, appropriation of the best arable land uh, by the church, you know, leaving the worst land uh, for Filipinos, um, uh, the suppression of prices. He looks at all kinds of factors, but his main argument is that um, the colonial ru rule removed the incentive to work from the Filipinos, and that resulted in their love, their loss for the love uh, of work. In, in other words, it resulted in, in, uh, in indolence because of the loss of uh, incentive, because of the insecurity and the, and the loss of incentive to work. Um, now, here, of course, you can see there's a direct link to, to Alatas in the sense that um, Alatas, like Rizal, um, said that the discourse on laziness uh, was more of a justification uh, of uh, colonial rule. Um, but um, for Alatas, it was not just colonial rule, it was colonial capitalism, um, which uh, the interests of which resulted in a distortion um, of uh, the um, image of the, the native, the so-called native. Um, and here, of course, you also have the idea that you don't take colonial discourse um, or any discourse for that matter at face value. It must be seen as a reflection of uh, material interests and the social situation. And of course, Alatas draws directly from Marx and, uh, and Karl Mannheim in his work, but also from uh, from Rizal, uh, the, the inspiration uh, and some of the ideas are from Rizal. Um, and for that reason, there is a, uh, a chapter in Alatas' Myth of the Lazy Native entitled The Indolence of the Filipinos, which is um, in honor of uh, Rizal's famous uh, essay, The Indolence of the Filipino. Um, but um, important difference between Alatas and Rizal was that Alatas lived in the post-colonial period, he, you know, his life spanned the pre-colonial, uh, the colonial and post-colonial period. Um, Rizal did not. So Rizal was not alive to see um, what Alatas saw, the continuity of colonial ideas, of Eurocentric ideas, uh, in um, the continuity between the colonial and post-colonial periods the internalization of coloniality, the internal, internalization of colonial ideas among um, uh, the post-colonial um, uh, people, especially the post-colonial elite. Um, and as expressed in scholarship, in, acad in academics, uh, it can be seen in the, the theory of uh, the culture of poverty, um, in, in which you know, the, uh, the idea that um, the, the backwardness of a community is due to their values rather than to structural uh, structural situation, class exploitation policies, and so on. Um, so um, there's something wrong with the, the cultural values of a particular community, and and there I think there is a link with uh, uh, with colonial ideas about the inherent incapac incapacities of uh, of the natives. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> So the, the, the continuity between the, the colonial and post-colonial periods in terms of colonial ideas, in, in other words, the um, continuing coloniality of ideas um, was recognized by Alatas and his, uh, his students um, who became scholars in their own right. Um, and that was understood to take place within the context of intellectual imperialism, uh, an, an idea which was uh, very early on in, uh, in the late 60s uh, conceptualized by by Alatas, I think he was one of the first to actually, not to use the term, not to recognize the problem, but to act, to, uh, to delineate it, to, to define it, intellectual imperialism. And then in the 70s, um, he, he discussed the psychological dimension of that, uh, um, 
with reference to the idea of the captive uh, mind. Um, so this is what Malay studies, as it developed in, in, in Singapore, um, has been all about. But, but, and I think this is an important qualification, um, Malay, the, the, um, Alatas and um, the scholars that came after him in Malay studies that were trained by him, um, such as um, Chandra Muzaffar, Shahruddin Maruf, um, Nur Aisha Abdurrahman, Azhar Ibrahim, uh, myself, um, have never considered Eurocentrism as the sole problem in the area of knowledge making and knowledge production. And I think this is where the Malay studies tradition differs from the other approaches uh, and perspectives in the decolonization of knowledge. Um, you know, the, the various approaches and perspectives that, that have emerged uh, since the 1950s that speak about decolonizing knowledge, indigenizing knowledge, nationalizing knowledge, uh, um, uh, sacralizing knowledge. Um, these are all responses to, to the dominance of Eurocentrism um, and they have their respective uh, prescriptions for knowledge making. Um, but in all of these cases, the dominant problem, the, the dominant problem is the hegemony of Eurocentric knowledge. But in the Malay studies approach, beginning with Alatas, but it continues very strongly um, um, among the scholars that I mentioned just now, Eurocentrism is only one of the problematic hegemonic orientations. Um, uh, other problematic or orientations um, are um, one which is very much discussed um, by uh, the, you know, the, um, the people, the scholars of this tradition. Um, one of them is Nor Shahriel uh, Saad, who is, I think, I, I think he's here. Um, uh, talk, who talks about traditionalism, the problem of the weight of traditional um, um, ideas and values which affect um, knowledge uh, uh, production. Um, this is also discussed uh, by uh, Nur Aisha um, Abdurrahman um, and um, uh, uh, Pradhana uh, Boy, uh, who, is, who, who was a student in Malay studies uh, and is now a scholar, uh, did his PhD with us, is now a scholar uh, in, um, in Indonesia, in, in uh, Malang, I believe. Um, so the problem of traditionalism, um, which affects knowledge production, which is a problem that's quite apart from that of uh, Eurocentrism. Just to give you a, a, a very simple uh, example, um, this, this is my own example. Um, you have uh, in Islamic uh, uh, tradition, um, certain uh, negative uh, portrayals um, in from early Islamic history that are associated with the Prophet himself, the Prophet Muhammad himself, um, uh, negative portrayals um, of um, and attitudes um, um, of the Jews. Uh, these have been accepted uncritically, passed down from generation to generation um, in the form of uh, traditions um, of the Prophet or um, in, in the form of, um, you know, uh, uh, story, uh, the, the, the um, history of the, the biography of the uh, prophet's life. Um, they, are take, they are handed down um, from generation to generation until today, taken uncritically, and form the basis of an anti-Semitic um, orientation in scholarship among Muslims, not just among religious ulama, but among, uh, you know, uh, social scientists uh, as well. We can say we can we can identify similar uh, traditions um, uh, with regard to Shiism, um, the myth um, which is largely rejected by Muslim scholars throughout history, but it still exists. Um, the myth that Shiism was a religion created by a Yemeni Jew who lived in the time of uh, Sayyidina Ali. Um, this myth is, is consumed by certain uh, sections uh, uh, in, 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 across the Muslim world, but even in, uh, in Malaysia. Uh, and um, it was discussed in academic papers as a justification for, uh, 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 for referring to Shiism as, uh, you know, as sasat, as we say in, uh, in Malay, 
sesat dan menyesatkan. It's a very nice phrase. Uh, it's very uh, an amusing phrase. It would be amusing if uh, it didn't have such, uh, you know, um, terrible consequences on Malaysian Shiites who have been persecuted in uh, in Malaysia. Um, but part of of the blame goes to this kind of traditionalist uh, uh, scholarship. So traditionalism. Um, and I would add, you know, giving the example of, of uh, Shiism just now, uh, sectarianism. Um, sectarianism is also an orientation found among uh, Muslims that affects um, knowledge um, uh, production. And another orientation which um, has a profound effect on knowledge production is androcentrism. Um, you know, earlier on I had mentioned that um, 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 about the neglect of um, women. Um, thinkers uh, as uh, the neglect, the, the, the attitude that women, there were no women uh, thinkers who were foundational uh, thinkers um, for the social sciences. Uh, there were no, in, in, there, there weren't any important women thinkers um, involved in the formative period of uh, the social sciences. Um, this is the male bias or androcentrism. Uh, this continues to affect uh, affect the uh, uh, knowledge production in the social sciences. Um, most, the vast majority of books on the history of sociology, on the history of social theory, do not refer to women founders of sociology. And I think the same can be said of many, you know, many of the other social sciences. Um, so we have um, traditionalism, we have uh, sectarianism, we have uh, androcentrism, we have uh, ethno-nationalism, right? And this is very much the case in, in Malaysia, and we, we, we see this happening um, um, in, in, in India today, you know, with uh, uh, the Hindutva movement, which is not merely, which doesn't merely have political repercussions, it affects knowledge production. It affects, for example, the teaching of history in schools. It affects uh, the, you know, the uh, interpretation of um, what it means to be a Muslim uh, in, in India. Um, it affects uh, historical interpretations uh, in, in, the te in the textbooks about you know, the coming of Islam to India and so on and so forth. Um, so ethno-nationalism is a problem. State authoritarianism is also a, a, a problem. Uh, in, in Malaysia, it, it, it's manifested in terms of the, the banning of books, uh, the, um, the um, um, harassment of scholars, um, uh, the detention of uh, scholars the um, authorities preventing certain seminars from taking place. This has happened. I, I myself have been banned from speaking in, in uh, at least two universities um, um, and, and even uh, a visiting appointment, you know, just merely a visiting appointment uh, uh, um, I, I, I was, was prevented in, in one of the universities. Um, so, but others have had far worse, uh, you know, experiences um, uh, than myself. So, um, therefore, uh, my father um, and um, his students and those who, who are influenced by him don't speak of the decolonization of knowledge. They speak of the need for an autonomous social science tradition, for autonomous knowledge, what we, we've started to call in, in Malay, uh, Ilmu Mandiri. Um, so we use the term mandiri to, to mean autonom autonomy uh, or autonomous. Um, we speak of autonomous knowledge because the idea is to be autonomous from all these various he hegemonic orientations, to be as independent or as free as possible from all these various orientations, not just Eurocentrism, but traditionalism, androcentrism, sectarianism, and others which may be found in, uh, in other parts of, uh, of the world. Um, so that would be the, you know, the, um, the, the relationship between uh, Malay studies and the larger decolonization um, um, movement. Um, I'm uh, coming to an end, so I want to end with, um, uh, just a few thoughts about the idea of a school of thought. Um, I, I believe, um, along with my, you know, with my um, colleagues and, and um, academic uh, comrades, that 
what has emerged in Malay studies is um, a school of thought, um, the, the tradition that has emerged from, when I say Malay studies, I'm, I'm still referring to the, the Department of Malay Studies at the University of Singapore, uh, at, at the then University of Singapore in 67 when the department was, was started. Um, now, although Alatas himself did not speak of a, of a school of thought, his ideas for an autonomous social science tradition have influenced um, scholars for at least two generations, and the school can be said to have um, emerged. Scholars and writers of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, such as uh, the, the names I mentioned earlier, Chandra Muzaffar, Sharuddin, Maruf, Wan Zawawi Ibrahim, Nur Aisha Abdurrahman, uh, Nur Shahril Saad, Azhar Ibrahim, uh, Tio Lee Ken, uh, Muhammad Imran Tai, Pradana Boy, Oki Puspa, Madasari, um, and, uh, and others um, are all part of this autonomous social science tradition in their various fields and can be said to represent um, the school of autonomous knowledge. Mm -hmm. Young scholars of the third generation um, uh, in their um, as, as they embark on, uh, you know, their dissertations uh, uh, for their masters and PhDs, um, uh, you know, uh, are also uh, can also be um, seen and identified. Um, so I think it's in, in, for that reason it can be called a living uh, tradition because it continues. And in fact, I, I would even argue that um, there is a, a revival of interest. Um, uh, among the younger generation, um, you know, people of my children's uh, generation, a revival of interest not only in my father's work, uh, but also in the work of uh, 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 others such as uh, Shahruddin, uh, Azhar, uh, Aisha, and, and, uh, and so on. Um, so, um, and of course, by a tradition, uh, by a school of thought, I'm not referring to an institution although a school of thought usually begins in an, in an institution, um, but I'm referring to um, a body of knowledge which begins with a, uh, a founder um, who has students. They become scholars in their own right. They continue that tradition of scholarship. Um, they broaden it. They go into different uh, areas. For example, my father hardly spoke about traditionalism, although he did, he did identify it as a problem, but he hardly spoke about it. But yet, you know, Aisha uh, Abdurrahman and uh, Nur Shahril Saad and others um, went, uh, went more deeply into the topic of um, uh, traditionalism and did empirical studies on the, on the problem. Um, and uh, the a school of thought also um, creates a body of knowledge um, that proceeds from one generation to another. Um, uh, it, um, uh, you know, it creates, uh, in that sense, it, it creates a, 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 um, a tradition. Um, and um, it, it has influence beyond the institution. Um, the school of thought has influence beyond the institution. Um, we, when we look at um, um, schools of sociology in the United States, you, know, you have the famous uh, Chicago School. Um, of sociology, um, but some African American um, scholars have been writing that um, the, the tradition of sociology established by W. E. B. Du Bois or Du Bois, as they say, um, preceded the Chicago School, and that there was actually a tradition of sociology uh, started by W. E. B. Du, du Bois, um, um, which resulted in a school of uh, uh, of sociology uh, at uh, the University of Atlanta, where W. B. Du Bois, du, where du Bois, du Bois was uh, was based, um, but because of the uh, uh, the, the racist or the prejudiced uh, nature of um, academia, that was not recognized. Uh, it's only recently begun to be recognized that prior to the Chicago School, there was a an African American. Um, um, or in those days, they, they, used to, they used the term Negro, there was an African-American originated school of sociology that preceded the Chicago School of uh, Sociology, but it was not recognized. I would like to say the same thing 
that there is something of a silencing going on, uh, at least in my university. I'm not saying it's the case outside uh, of, of, of Singapore, but in my own university, I, I, I find it amazing. You know, it's, uh, uh, it, it's um, amusing, it's amazing. Um, it's also uh, pathetic, I think, if I may, um, um, may, if I may say so, that when, when people talk about uh, decolonization of knowledge, when they talk about decolonial thought, um, uh, when they um, you know, talk about different uh, perspectives and approaches, um, they mention um, you know, a, uh, a whole list of uh, different approaches that have uh, emerged in the last decades from around the world. They talk about um, subaltern studies, they talk about um, uh, you know, the indigenization of uh, anthropology and sociology um, ideas that have emerged from India. Uh, they talk about um, uh, uh, Asia's method uh, approach. They talk about all these approaches, except for um, the approach that had emerged from uh, Malay studies uh, at their own institution, the National University of, uh, of Singapore. Um, so um, um, th 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 this to me, of course, you know, has to do with the larger problem of, uh, of silencing. And the, si and the silencing, the problem of silencing is an issue that has been discussed um, within uh, uh, decoloni decolonization of, uh, uh, of knowledge in the sense that, you know, as I referred to earlier on, um, thinkers from local traditions, ideas from local traditions are marginalized or even um, uh, ignored. Um, so Rizal, for example, is, is not ignored, but he's confined to area studies as if he's not relevant to sociology or anthropology or, or history. He's confined to Southeast Asian studies. Ibn Khaldun is confined to North African or uh, Middle East uh, studies. So there's that kind of silencing in terms of this non-recognition and sometimes even uh, uh, omission. Um, but um, outside of the of, of Singapore, of course, I think um, um, even as far as Africa, where there's um, a great deal of attention to, um, uh, especially uh, to the notions of intellectual imperialism and the captive mind, uh, are being are being discussed by scholars in Africa, particularly in uh, in West Africa and uh, in South Africa. Um, um, but um, I suppose let me conclude um, by saying that. Um, just to, to, uh, to, to sort of summarize very quickly that there is a distinct approach in Malay studies uh, that developed um, uh, in, at the University of Singapore, um, which um, is more than a decolonial approach um, uh, because it is um, wary of other hegemonic orientations in the social sciences um, and that that approach had become uh, uh, it eventually emerged as a school of, uh, um, of, of uh, in, in the social sciences. Perhaps the only school in the social sciences that has emerged from, certainly that has emerged from Singapore, but um, maybe even the entire uh, Malay world. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's also important to note that this is a peculiar development at the University of Singapore. Um, which is, of course, now the National University of Singapore, um, in the sense that Malay studies in Malaysia um, does not follow this tradition, that Malay studies in Malaysia tends to um, be uh, traditional, um, you know, with the, you know, the interest in philology and, and, li and literature um, and the lack of a social science perspective, even when it comes to the study of, uh, of literature. So Malay studies there tends to be more traditional and one might even you know, uh, suggest um, a, a more colonial in orientation. Um, um, and uh, yes, and I, I think uh, I, will, I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very thoughtful presentation that um, I've taken lots of notes. I'm sure everybody else uh, is as, as well. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, comments and questions. Um, and so just to repeat, um, actually, Yingjing, are we going to record the questions or should we stop the recording uh, for the questions? Uh, yeah, it depends on Prof. Prof. Farid, are you fine with um, recording the yes, Q&A? 
That's fine, yeah. And also the audience as well. If uh, if the audience don't want to be recorded, maybe just let us know. Now push uh, stop. Sounds like a plan. Great. So if you look at the reactions uh, emoji <laughs> button down on your uh, bottom right hand of the screen, if you click on reactions and then raise hand, um, I can then uh, cross to you and um, you can just uh, ask your question verbally um, or give a comment verbally. Um, so if anyone would like to do that, uh, please go ahead. And um, uh, the first question uh, that I've seen here is Robert Cribb. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Alatas. It was a, a very interesting, uh, interesting presentation. I was particularly taken by your uh, by the way you followed through from Rizal and the critique of uh, alleged laziness amongst the, the Filipinos and the broader, your broader critique of the idea that uh, people who are poor are poor because of their attitudes rather than because of the, the social forces that confine them to, to poverty. Um, so that's, that's very much a line of argument that I appreciate. But when you go I'll go on to, to talk about the captive mind as an element in keeping people in lower socioeconomic positions. Mm -hmm. It feels to me that you risk shifting significantly back into that culture of poverty argument. You're dealing then with the frame of mind of people rather than with the external circumstances that keep them confined. So I wonder how you reconcile what seems to me a really important contradiction there. Uh, thank you, um, Professor Cribb. Um, I, I think I may have um, not made it uh, clear just now that the idea of the captive mind was not in relation to um, uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, you know, aspects. Uh, it, it's more the intellectual problem of um, mimicry or imitation among academics of uh, scholarship, um, which, so it's related, of course, to the issue of socioeconomic uh, issues in the sense that to the extent that the ruling elite are captive minds and have, have in, internalized the colonial discourse on native incapacities um, and policies are then created, um, such as the Bumiputra policy uh, in Malaysia, the idea that Malay society cannot survive without the patronage of the, the Malay dominated party, um, that the Malays will lose out to the Chinese and the Malays will even be lost from the, uh, from, from the, from the world. You know, Malayu akan hilang dari dunia, as they say. Um, so um, so it, it, the, the mental captivity uh, as a problem in terms of, of, of knowledge uh, you know, uh, making, knowledge production has an impact on um, the, the, the dominant uh, worldview among the Malays themselves. So this idea of basic Malay incapacities has seeped into the, the Malay mind and, and the Malay says to themselves, yeah, we, you know, the, the Malay worker says to himself, we can't survive without um, the onslaught of Chinese competition without the patronage of the Malay state. We can't make it on our own. That, that, that's what I meant. Okay, th thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have uh, other questions? Feel free at any time to just put your hand up and um, I'll, I'll take a, a list there and we'll see where you are. Uh, the next question is from Yingjing. Yep. Uh, thank you, Prof. Um, it's really wonderful to, to, uh, uh, to, to listen to, to your talk again, you know, about, about autonomous tradition in the Malay world, which is something that people from the Malay world often feel that, um, you know, when we need to think about uh, 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 um, the, the tradition of our knowledge, we always look east or look west, but we don't look into ourselves. So, yeah, I just wonder whether you can kind of, if I could kind of, uh, uh, ask you to compare a, a little bit about the state of Malay studies in Malaysia and Singapore, respectively, because I know that you have been focusing a lot on, on NUS Malay Studies Department, which is a really uh, uh, important um, uh, uh, department in, in the field. But what about um, the state of Malay studies in, in Malaysia yeah. itself today? Because yeah. I, as far as I uh, understand, the, uh, the because of the colonial construction of university in, in University of Malaya, 
uh, the, the Singapore campus as well as in the KL campus. Right now we have this, you know, the, like the separation of, of, of disciplines or knowledge into Chinese studies, Malay studies, English studies, and, and Indian studies in, in, in the universities. It seems like um, uh, uh, people study the Malay world because these groups of people, they, they all study the Malay world, but through their own different uh, disciplinary approach and also linguistic approach and and how, how do we kind of overcome this 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 kind of um, separation of, of, of knowledge and you know I think it's also a racialization of knowledge in, in our part of the world yeah yeah, so, yeah. Wonder if you comment on yeah, that. yeah thank you Yixin. that's you know it's a uh, it's a very interesting um, issue actually uh, something which I hope to to work on uh, more in, in, in the future um, so if we if we consider um, we consider that Malay studies as area studies originated from a number of disciplines, right? One of them, of course, would be literature. Literature is very important uh, in, in the emergence of Malay studies. But the other discipline would have been uh, anthropology. Um, and uh, it seems to me that um, Malay studies, as it developed in Singapore, um, is more uh, a result of the influence of um, uh, sociology rather than anthropology and certainly uh, not uh, literature. Whereas um, Malay studies as it developed in Indonesia, by which I mean specifically the study of Malays as a suku in Indonesia, but also um, Indones Indonesian studies in general, um, as it developed in Indonesia and in Malaysia is more a result of the influence of, uh, of literature, um, but also anthropology. But there's a difference between the two. Um, it's, it's a bit, you know, con complicated and convoluted. Um, uh, you know, anthropology and later sociology, um, the, 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 the English, uh, the British tradition of anthropology, uh, the Dutch tradition of uh, anthropology and, uh, and sociology had, of course, the impact on the development of uh, Malay studies in Malaysia and Indonesia. Later on, I think the Dutch tradition became it receded into the background and uh, you know, American anthropology was more influential. But the point is, um, um, and the, the, the British oriented and later American oriented anthropology and sociology, uh, which influenced the development of the Department of Sociology in Singapore, which influenced the development of Malay studies in Malaysia and Indonesia, um, and which influenced uh, the development of the departments of anthropology and sociology in Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, I would say, just to, to put it broadly, were Eurocentric in the sense that they were not conscious of the problems of marginali the marginalization of the local concepts, ideas, what I defined as Eurocentrism just now. But it is because my father and this is something by way of historical accident, was, although he was Malaysian, eventually, he was born in Indonesia, was, you know, colonial subject, Dutch colonial subject for some time, and for that reason studied in Indonesia, uh, in the Netherlands. But in the Netherlands, he, he happened to study under scholars like uh, uh, Wim Bertheim, who were anti-colonial, and who were rather critical in their uh, approach. Um, and when my father returned, he did not return to Indonesia. He, he came to, uh, to Malaysia, eventually established himself in Singapore. And for that reason, the tradition of Malay studies in Singapore developed along the lines that I had uh, discussed earlier. Uh, but the, the tradition of Malay studies elsewhere, uh, I think, is more of a continuity from the, from the colonial uh, period. So that is sort of you know, a, a short answer to your, uh, to your question. Um, of course, it's a bit more complicated because we need to look at um, the study of the Malay world in anthropology, sociology departments in Malaysia and Indonesia, as opposed to the study of the Malay world in Malay studies. And I think the, the, the distinction is more is that in Malay studies in Malaysia, um, Malay studies is more uh, literary, uh, you know, it's more concerned with literature, with the study of literary genres, with philology, with language. Um, uh, whereas the social scientific study of the Malay world is left to the departments of anthropology and sociology, but I would argue in a Eurocentric, in a largely Eurocentric manner. I also wanted to say that 
the Department of Malay Studies in Singapore, I believe is moving away from that tradition. I, I think they're moving away from the legacy. And I don't mean this as a criticism, in case any of my colleagues are, you know, are listening. It's not a criticism. Uh, you, you can never expect a department to continue its legacy forever. Um, but I think we are living uh, in, in, in we, we, I'm, I'm at a time uh, uh, at, at the university, at the department, where it is moving away from the tradition. Um, I can only hope that the tradition continues uh, elsewhere outside of the, of the department. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from Jonathan Tianji. Uh, you're still muted, Jonathan. Hi, Paul Farid. Thank you for the talk. Hi, so, Jonathan. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, thank you. Are, are you are you in uh, Malaysia or somewhere else? I'm in, I'm in Malaysia. Uh, okay. I'm doing my, doing my PhD in Cambridge, but I'm in Malaysia for you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I, I thought it was quite interesting what you said about um, how you contrast the autonomous tradition with uh, other decolonial traditions, right? By saying that it, uh, it it tackles not only Eurocentrism but other problematic hegemonic orientations. I guess my question is um, related related to because um, because I understand clearly the analytical relationship between autonomous tradition and Eurocentrism, right? Which is basically that when we think locally, we can create concepts and theories that escape the Western standpoint. But I don't really have that clarity with regards to other hegemonic, uh, other hegemonic orientations, right? Like sectarianism or ethnonationalism. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And I, so I, 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 unless perhaps we're using autonomous very broadly right, to say like we're autonomous from, from bias, autonomous from bad social science. Right? And then, then I think uh, I wonder whether you risk losing some analytical clarity and cohesion, right? By, uh, by yeah, by sort of making this tradition as against all these uh, bad social scientific practices or bad frameworks to think about social science. So yeah, that, that, that's what yeah. I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and, and those things need to be uh, need to be discussed and uh, fleshed out. Um, so we might be clearer about what we mean by decolonizing knowledge, um, reviving, you know identifying, reviving uh, traditional um, ideas, concepts from the tradition, identifying exemplars for, for modern social science, such as Rizal. In my own case, I do Rizal. I'm interested in Ivan Khaldun and so on. So we're clear about that. Um, but I think we can be equally, equally clear about um, the, um, um, you know, dealing with um, other hegemonic uh, orientations. Uh, for example, sectarianism, ethno-nationalism, um, it's the same kind of work that needs to be done. Um, the identification of exemplars. Um, for, for example, um, people are, um, the, the, the hegemonic orientation of casteism in India, right? Um, to deal with that, people are identifying exemplars. Thinkers who have a different attitude or different approach, a different conceptualization of caste, uh, who have crit crit critiques of caste in the tradition that are submerged, that are covered up, and are now being uncovered. Um, alternative interpretation of the Hindu tradition, um, which, which suggests that caste is not as rigid as uh, what people make, uh, make it out to be. Um, this kind of thing, right? So um, the same thing goes, with, goes for sectarianism. We, uh, we have a dominant interpretation that uh, gives us the impression that uh, you know, Sunni and Shiite communities um, have been at war uh, with each other since the beginning of uh, of, of Islam, um, but then when we you know when we look at um, uh, at uh, early uh, Islamic scholarship, we we see that the situation was a lot more complex. Uh, that there wasn't this you know rigid distinction between Sunni and uh, Shia. Um, that um, you know you was you had communities and scholars that um, today would be um, uh, seen as a, a mix and match. Um, but the categories were not, you know. So, so what what we are doing is um, recovering interpretations. Um, but the question is, you know, are we recovering interpret? 
we, are we recovering interpretations that deal with the B, with the Eurocentric problem, or do we recover interpretations that deal with uh, the androcentric problem, or the uh, or the sectarian problem, or the ethno-nationalist problem? When we talk about the concept of Malay, what it means to be Malay, um, the uh, you know uh, the issue of um, uh, the lack of a notion of ethnicity um, uh, among pre-modern Malays, then we're also moving towards. Um, uh, you know, a, a deconstruction of ideas, um, but against ethno-nationalism rather than, than Eurocentrism. Um, and of course, as far as androcentrism is concerned, there's a lot of literature, um, you know, written by feminists who talk about feminist standpoint and um, the need to, uh, you know, to understand societies uh, from the perspective or the point of view of, of uh, women's uh, experiences. And even in literature, you have the idea of um, um, uh, um, gyno uh, criticism, uh, something which was um, um, been written about by one of um, uh, uh, our, by a Malaysian scholar, um, uh, Nur Hayati Abdul Rahman, I believe. She's she's written on gyno gyno critics or gyno criticism. So uh, I think we can be clear about um, you know. Um, the kind of knowledge construction that we need to engage in uh, to deal with these other orientations apart from Eurocentrism. Thank you. Great. Uh, next question is from Natusha Naidu. Um, hello. Hi, Hi Natusha. Natusha, how are you? Yeah, uh, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, um, so I just, uh, my question is about like this idea of like, forming political theory from outside the canon. Um, besides like, you know, Eurocentric uh, or European theories. And I think one of the things that um, I am working on and I have trouble with is like, when we look at Malay studies and like uh, now this project of trying to create a school of thought and like political theory from uh, the Malay world, right? Um, one of the things that I think uh, gets excluded a lot, and this is definitely the case with NUS Malay studies, is um, political thought from Southern Thailand or Patani. Um, so that's and the thing is like uh, so. I, I just, what I really want to ask you is that because like so, for example, Patani st studies is like excluded um, from Malay studies, and my interest in my project is actually to bring it back into. Uh, push it into the canon of like Malay, not push in the canon, but more like it should be considered in the canon of Malay study. And um, one of the things is that how do we like look at Islamic political thought from this region and then kind of approach it as political theory in general? Because one of my observations is that when we study like Islamic political thought, um, and just to contextualize it like Patani, right? There's a lot of like it may come from like. Uh, ulama, so it automatically gets like framed as um, Muslim political or, or like within the realms of just Islamic studies. But some of these right, a lot of these writings are uh, about the about the right to self determination in the state of Patani and like actualizing this idea of nation, right, from a very original theoretical perspective, not necessarily coming from maybe like these people are trained in like Mecca and whatnot, but then. It's coming from also an indigenous tradition of like um, Patani Malay uh, political thought. Then, so um, how do we like as scholars or out outsiders like me then um, approach this topic and how and what are we actually in need of addressing when it comes to like taking like Islamic political thought out and treating it as uh, a new way of like a new way of a new political theory of um, self-determination or human rights that's not that's outside you know like eurocentric frameworks it's just something on its own yeah 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 that's it that's also i think a, a very good um um uh, you know uh, agenda for for research um on political thought or political theory so th the answer of course will be very long um so um, um you know um, I have to, we have to ask Ross if we can stay for another one hour or so. <laughs> if we, we, we can <laughs> summarize it in two minutes, that would be Yeah, fun. okay. So I will, I will talk to you about, about this uh, later, Natusha, but the short answer is that um, there is a genre of uh, 
of, of, of literature, uh, which, will, which is what we would call today political thought in Islamic tradition, right? Uh, it, it's called the Nasiha or Nasihat, as I'm ready to say, tradition, um, which emerges um, from, I guess, from the you know, very earliest, 9th or 10th century, um, associated with Nizam al Mulk, Al Ghazali, and, uh, and so on. And then you have the Malay expressions uh, in terms of, uh, for example, Bustanu Salatin and Taju Salatin of Bukhari Jauhari, Bustanu Salatin of Raniri. Um, um, and th th this genre has, you know, uh, um, has a number of aspects to it. Uh, one aspect of it is advice to rulers. Another aspect is um, uh, like a manual of uh, administration for, uh, for, for rulers. Um, uh, and there are a few other aspects. So there is that genre, right? So when you work on the Patani thing, because you need to relate it to, to see how it is related to that, uh, to that genre. Um, and then you also need to look at where, where the modern influences uh, uh, come in. Um, and then, you know, I think that is the basis upon which you, you construct something um, that might be original. One has to see whether it's something that can be original and different, uh, but yet is rooted in, in various traditions, the Islamic as well as uh, the modern Western uh, tradition. That's how I would approach it, but, you know, we can discuss it more in more detail. Great, thank you. And in, and in uh, the final minute and a half, I, I just wanted to push you a little bit more on the nature of the threat to Ilmu Mandiri. Mm -hmm. And does it vary from country to country or you know, state to state? The biggest threat to Ilmu Mandiri in Australia would be Anglo-centrism. In Malaysia, it would be ethno-nationalism. In Singapore, it would be state authoritarianism. It, does the does the autonomous social science tradition rank threats in some of its scholarship or is it all equal and how would yeah, you like to um, respond to that? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, uh, just, that's a very good point. It, it's certainly not all equal. Um, I, I think the, the threats um, uh, would be greater in more authoritarian states, uh, certainly. Um, but uh, sometimes the threat, uh, you know, is not what we think it is. In Singapore, I think the threat is not the authoritarian state uh, because um, whatever you might say about Singapore, it's certainly not a liberal democracy, but um, there's much freedom in the university to do a lot of things um, which you know, are counter to um, androcentrism and Eurocentrism and so on. But I think um, the big problem is, uh, is Eurocentrism in, uh, in Singapore, in our universities, uh, not, not so much the, the state. Um, there are a lot of things we can do counter Eurocentrism that we're not doing, and I think it's because of the the reign of the, the captive mind, um, um, and, and you know there isn't this challenge to hegemonic orientations, not only Eurocentrism but other hegemonic uh, orientations. Um, in in Malaysia, Eurocentrism is a, a very severe problem, but it, it's it's exacerbated by ethno nationalism, the interference of uh, of the authorities in the university system, um, the, the lack of attention to university uh, leadership, you know, for example, not appointing proper people in, in, in high positions, you know, as vice chancellors or uh, deans of uh, faculties or heads of department, um, racism um, on campus um, and uh, academic dishonesty. You know, we, we have a very severe problem of uh, graduate students in many universities being forced to put the names of their supervisors, um, even though the supervisors may not do work. Um, so you have, you know, uh, supervisors, uh, you have pe people with long list publications, co-authored publications, um, without having done uh, uh, most of the work. Um, so a host of problems that affect knowledge production. Great, thank you very much. And if we could all... Um put our virtual hands together uh, to thank uh, Prof Farid for a very stimulating talk and a, um, a wonderful discussion. Thank you to all those who contributed to, um, to coming today and, um, and for asking questions. So we will have um, another um, Malaysia Institute webinar next month. Um, so uh, if you're not part of our mailing list, please do join up at the Institute um, malaysiainstitute.anu.edu.au. Uh, thank you again and enjoy your evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.